tonight. Um, and uh, I'm ready for a great conversation. The book is called Concealed by Esther Amini. And uh, it's a story of family, immigration, Judaism, and maybe a little bit of uh, trauma along the way, which is always a part of life. Part of Judaism. Well, part of Judaism and life and immigration. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome formally Ariella to fearlessly lead us in the book conversation. Yeah, thank you. Sure, for the introduction. It's a team effort to have a book club, a successful and fun book club for everybody. So thank you, you all for joining on a Thursday night. Um, okay, so conceal. I will, if that's okay, jump ahead with my impressions of the book and then we'll love to hear from you. Why do you, whether you enjoy the reading, whether you take something interesting um, for yourself and just go from there. Um, so here's some confessions. I've read very few memoirs in my life. So it's definitely a new type of genre. So I, that's part of the conversation I wanna have and understand people with more experience on this type of books, how you compare with others. I'm more into novels, I realize. <laughs> um, had a hard time catching into the book. I, at the beginning, I was like, is it well written even? Like I thought it wasn't really well written. Um, and then the more I, I read it, I realized that maybe it's just me expecting like literature out of it instead of just getting into a story. Um, so that's just like, it took me a while to get into it. But then once I got into it, I thought that the honesty on the, the characters and the relationships was so well done and in, in, in real, just like, I could really appreciate the people and the family and the relationships and the complexity that I ended and started enjoying. I wanted to see how like this family evolved in the US. So definitely after the first 30 pages, which if it would have not been for a book club, I could have potentially just put it down and not continue reading, I'll be honest. Um, but it just kept me going and, and um, ended up enjoying it a lot and, and kind of was able to understand a lot of the reviews because it's people I, I respect. I'm like, why did they like it? You know, So um, ended up being like definitely valuable. Um, just a lot of strong relationships, strong characters that I think we can have a good time talking about. So anyone who read the book, I would love to hear what's your impressions. I did not read the book. I just okay. thought I would listen a little bit. Sure. So I Absolutely. actually may uh, leave the meeting. You know, I just wanted to get a little feel. For yeah, it. absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. I did buy an, I, I bought the Kindle and I could not get to it. Okay. Mm, then inertia. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So any comments on the book? Um, just general comments. I really loved it. And maybe it's because I came from a dysfunctional family that with drama and trauma that I could identify, though I have to admit this family was, they outdid mine. This was really over the top. And uh, that the mother, I just could never come to, to terms with her. And I just admired the daughter that she seemed to, you know, evolve out of this really uh, difficult situation and become, you know, quite a well-balanced, tolerant, accepting person. Um, I just admired her immensely for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, see, we're just giving general appreciations of the book. I started with a confession that took me more than, if it wouldn't have been for the book club, I could have potentially put the book down and not finish it because it didn't captivate me in the first 20, 30 pages. 
but eventually really got to appreciate the depth of the characters and how honest and raw the, the, the memoir was. So um, Adele, thank you for your feedback. And I don't know anyone else, just take a general appreciation of the book. Um, we'll love to hear. Uh, I'm, I, I started the, the book, but I'm not done. Um, I like it very much so far. Uh, same to you, I'm not really uh, used to, to memoir, but also I watch a TV show recently, Tehran. Um, it's an yep. Israeli show, it's a spy show, but like, you know, it, it, uh, it's nowadays and it talk about being Jewish in, uh, in Tehran. So it was a good illustration and um, you know, I like how you go through their, their thoughts, the mother, um, how is it? I mean, you know, I, I came to the USA from France. It's definitely not the same kind of experience. So it's really interesting to me to see, um, you know, their, their experience and um, even like the mother daughter, I'm like, you know, I'm thinking with my daughter, I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe she's embarrassed too sometimes <laughs> with my accent and being loud and, you know, so, but so not, not much trauma. And I think the, it was, I mean, so far really heavy with the oppression, you know, from the, 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 the father to the daughter and also, um, it made me think a lot because you go through the thought of yeah the author and um, you see how much parents can impact the you know the the, the kids growing up sometime by uh, I mean little act or word you say then right so yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Steve, I think you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, um, actually, I, I agree and disagree with you, uh, what you just said, Ariel, because I, I agree with you generally within three, four, five pages. I say, this is going to be a great book, or I don't know, maybe this uh, was a waste of, of money. I shouldn't have uh, bought it from Amazon. <laughs> right. But so this one, it actually, this one caught me the first page. Oh, I no, knew no, I was no. going to enjoy it. Now, I had ups and downs, but including my likes and dislikes. And I'd say the first third, the father was rather a, um, a, a tyrant and it was easy to dislike him. And all of a sudden I kept started seeing some uh, traits in the mother that um, just were not acceptable. And, uh, you know, we can say, of course, there, there's children of, of their environment. They, and, God forbid, you know, the environment they grew up in is just beyond comprehension. But if you took 10 men and 10 women and put them in the same environment, you'd have 10 very different uh, outcomes, 10 very different people or 20, 20 very different people. So, uh, you know, and I saw part of the father, I think the father was five feet tall. Now imagine in, in a country where you're threatened just for your religion, and imagine the bullying this when he was younger, this guy had, because, you know, today, even six, three, six, four, six, five, <laughs> I mean, five, four, five, 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 six, is like a shorter average height. Version so right, he, and, yes. he, and he was in an environment where uh, I, I feel like um, the Iranian, the whole culture there, uh, men were more um, uh, they were more valued the more masculine they, they were. Okay, where Jewish men, of course you wanna be masculine, but you wanna be kind, you wanna be a, a good husband, a good father, you wanna be educated, you wanna be a, live a Torah life. The values are very different. So, you know, I, I felt most sorry for the father and, and was, we could see that character develop. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 I just developed not particularly a great fondness but I saw how he, he was not a bad man. If, if, and the mother also, you know, she went through a lot, but the, um, the chutzpah that she exhibited right. uh, was just, wouldn't be acceptable. And I think 
most people, and I've, I've run into people like that in the, you know, when I lived in New York for quite a while. And when people were like that, I just backed away, you know, just, uh, I, I, I don't want to be in their home. I, you know, like I've had better things to do. So, but it was a wonderful book. Um, I'm putting that book and uh, the Alice Hoffman book, uh, The Dove, Dove Keepers in a Box, uh, with two other books that I read, and they're going uh, to my niece and my uh, sister-in-law. Awesome. So, so far, both books I thought were just great. I'm happy to really hear. Good. So, very happy to hear. So, uh, within that line, I think my first question is, okay, so I also made a confession that I'm not very well versed in memoirs. I, I think the last one I read was Michelle Obama's memoirs. I thought uh, it was fun. I'm very, her own life was a very captivating. In this case, a lot of what she experienced was her parents' experience. You know, so I had that contrast of, at the beginning. I was like, are you writing about your parents or are you writing about you? You know, like, mm -hmm. who is this book about it? And, and then I was able to understand it really was how she was able to transform her, herself even given her experience and, and got into terms with a lot on, on the, in the book as it continued. But one of the contracts with a novel is like in a novel, I think it's much easier, even well-written, well-developed 500, 600 pages novel, you get to take sides on the characters much easier. Like this, the, the bad guys and the good guys and, and, and quote unquote, but even like, even the complex characters, you feel Want, your feelings tend to be more consistent. Here, it happened to me that like, I was like, oh, the dad is, is just a bad guy, or then he's really not, and he's just a result of his environment and upbringing. So is there, just in general, and, and we see it through the characters of the book, but is there a set of circumstances that allow us to behave in a certain way or make it almost like, like my mind went right away. It's like um, people that abuse, they were a victim of abuse. That doesn't make it less reprehensive, the fact that they're abusing now, you know? So is the, the background on the way they grew up at all a way of like for us to feel bad for them or forgive them or even feel some sort of like, just like need to, to help them? Need, need to nurture them. They they lack so much love and nurture. -ish. So I I I, I was compelled and confused with my own feelings with the characters and how I, I went from like almost hate to compassion to understanding. So I would love to hear um, everybody's thought on, on this type of like um, character development, especially let's be honest, this is what the mom and the dad, I think the kids were you love them right away. <laughs> like Albert is his amazing brother, David too. So like, I didn't have that problem with it, with the, the kids, but with the parents, I, I would love to hear your thought on there. You know, for the mother, you know, it's probably a matter of, you know, um, what they call epigenetics, you know, things that her grandparents suffered, her parents suffered, she, you know, this kind of this generational pain and I can understand it and have compassion. But if I had been in the room when she was humiliating her husband like that, I wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's, I can understand and I have compassion, but I, I wouldn't tolerate it, that's all I'm saying. I, I couldn't have a relationship. It was hard to read even uh, that, that yeah. piece, I, I, I see. It was just over the top. Right. I was actually, somewhat confused by all the ladies that used to congregate in her kitchen. And I mean, it was uh, sort of a mean atmosphere. Yeah, but, but also these women were forced into marriage at a, a childhood, let's be honest. They were mm -hmm. between nine to 14 years old, most of them. And, and again, you understand the parents, a lot of the parents come from a point of view as like, if they get raped, God forbid, they will not be eligible for marriage. So you want to marry them, marry them young. Like, I'm not trying to say whether this was an evil practice, even though like from today's eyes, it's like clearly horrible, you know, but back then it was almost like a way of protecting their daughters. But they get into marriage at, at age nine, 10 to men that are 20 years older. 
is that hate and I don't know, I just cannot imagine like in her case, I don't know that that was to me i think like the the hardest part to read is that scene when she goes off about her husband in public and it's very like the husband doesn't say anything and like i'm like oh my god like poor kids that are there like crazy scene but again go back to the same thing can you judge that behavior based on her set of experiences and and i don't know well, I'm sad it happened for her, but I still don't think I would be with her. That's all. Right. No. I understand right. that compassion, but I don't think I would choose her as my friend. Right. I, I had empathy for her, but she was actually the abusive one in the relationship. Right. You know, we right. all tend to worry about... Uh, you know, women, she was hitting her husband with the with the end of a high heel, which is like a, a pencil or something. Could you know how, uh, that to me, that relationship and maybe we can go a little bit into the relationship because to me it broke any potential stereotype. Like is this this men that are supposed to be super like patriarchal and power driven people. Um just let her be, you know, let her leave the house for a week and come back. Let her go spend all this money. Let her hit him. He never touched her. Like, it's really their relationship to me was like almost as he felt guilty that it, they go to me. I, I, I didn't have a clear understanding mm -hmm. of, of that relationship. Well, I think it was really a flawed relationship all the way through because uh, you, you find out, you assume that he's uh, suddenly you know, doing well. And of course he had financial ups and downs, but right. when he had the financial downs, he couldn't speak to his wife about it and say, we've got to you know, pull in our, our, oh, our belt. Right. We've got to you know, cut back a little. He let her go you know, buy jewelry, buy you know, designer dresses, so forth. And he's worried about you know, keeping his business going or even you know, paying the rent or mortgage. So it, it, it was totally dysfunctional relationship. Crazy that and that that's and these kids are the result of the relationship and they seem pretty functional and it's it's very interesting to me that the relationship between the parents because I think at the towards the end of the book where you see how she, the um, Esther like the author some somehow find reconciliation with the dad I don't think she found that with the mother the way the book is written you know like mm -hmm. I think she was able to see her father actions, even though they were extreme and they were reprehensible, coming from a place of love. And I don't think she was able to see that from the mom. Like, I think she never found that it's coming from a place, place of love. Even in until she tried to explain a lot of why the behaviors were the way she, the mom behaved the way she was, but even when she's dying, she's like, is this the mother I, maybe I'm, I'm mourning not having a mom ever in my life. She's mm -hmm. not mourning only her mom dying, you know, at 70 something. It's mourning the fact that she never had a mother. Even till the last day, she was hoping to have a mother and she never got one. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't think she had that experience with her father. I think at the end, she, she saw a, a dad and Growing up, you can say that the father was more, I mean, it's really hard to, to measure these different behaviors, but more severe, you know, like he didn't let her do all this stuff. The mom was much more permissible, you know, treating all her friends well, dad would not let anyone in the house, you know, much more restrictive. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, she was able to see those behaviors as coming from a place of love. And I don't mm -hmm. think she was able to see that with the, with the mom. I thought that she showed a remarkable amount of acceptance, though. You know, like accepting that her mother she cheated at a card game with her five, five. You know, she came to terms with this woman. That I can't say. I don't know if she felt any great love. I think you put it very well. She never had a mother. 
And so when her mother died, she, she was missing the mother that she never had. But I do think she came to term, she saw her mother just as she actually was. Right. Right. She was able to, to just almost ac accept who she was. Um, in, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of disturbing. I, and I was trying to go back to when I was reviewing the book for today. It's like, what are those situations that she describes that you would say were completely abused or completely like outside of any norm? And like for the mom, they seem less. So the, the, there is this this event in which she started talking about the father. It's not against the daughter, but potentially horribly embarrassing. Um, there is this few events that she described at the beginning of the book in which she is not allowed to, or she's brought into these situations against her will in which the mom will be like super outspoken and lie openly, you know, and the daughter is super embarrassed. But again, it's, there's not abuse. This is who the mom is. And, the, and, and it's more than, you know. But then with the, the dad, you think, you, if I was trying to go back to her early life, I think some of the experiences were more traumatic, quote unquote. He um, not letting her read books or not letting her go to college or not learning, even though she, she was able to do these things. but. The original idea was like she's not allowed. Um, not letting her have friends cut in like into the conversation, you know, like getting in the middle of like picking up the phone, not letting her, you know. So even though I I don't I I still think that her she was able to forgive the father and not the mom. And I and I'm 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 curious why, but that's my my understanding of the book. You know, in I don't know. I mean, this the, this experience of of the Jewish experience, the immigrant. I I was fascinated to see how much of their traditions were Iranian traditions, and 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 frankly, Muslims traditions, and not necessarily Jewish per nature. So, so like how we are all very much a result of that immigrant experience. Like in my case, so I mean, I'm now I will, I guess I'm, I'm also an immigrant. I, I grew up in, in, I was born in the States. I grew up in Chile most of my life, but my immigration story is that my grandparents came from Turkey. Okay, so that's like, that's the, the Jewish type of immigration and they lived there for hundreds of years. Before that, they were expelled from Spain. We, we can track my family back to Spain. And a lot of the traditions they brought with them, it's that, that experience, is the Turkish Jewish experience. Um, similarly with the Iranian experience, they were never integrated in society. They were never part of society. Like, Turkey, to be honest, the, the Muslims were very, they, they had a good relationship, business relationship, just were able to accumulate wealth in, in a much more civilized type of experience. But, um, but definitely the Judaism hey, was um, affected by it. So I guess to me, one of the most interesting topics of the book is to see how when the, the next generation is trying to liberate themselves, they're trying to liberate to things that are clearly intended to suppress either women or intellect, like um, not having women have an education and all these different components that they're look, leaving behind and you're like proud of them, proud of the fact that they're able to, to, to see the, the value of an education for women or the value of um, contributing to society and, and all this stuff, but like leaving their Jewish practice seemed to be part of the, of that liberation of like, I don't think it was easy for them to distinguish as like what is Jewish and what is Iranian or what, what I, as a whole, they left 
they, they lived generations after generations underground in Iran, being like these super religious Jews. And then they come into America and in a generation, they advance so much to be free, to be open, to be intellectually curious. And is it part of that experience leaving almost like a need to leave that practice of Judaism the way it was done before or not? And I know I like rumble a little bit, um, Rabbi Ari and I spoke about this specific topic before. I know he has a lot to say, but also if anyone else has like inputs on this, it's like how this, I will, I wanna leave some of my Iranian type of roots, not traditions because traditions can be beautiful, but, but like restrictions behind is that requires me to leave some of my Judaism behind as well. You know, in the book, you never hear about lighting the Shabbos candles, you know, you never hear of anything, at least I don't recall, you know, synagogue, holidays, Shabbos. I mean, I, they were entertaining and they had parties, but I didn't get a lot about like, oh, I had to be an underground Jew there. Now I'm going to be out in your face Jew here. I mean, right. Right, but, but it's still there were, I mean, and, and, and we take the daughter's definition, like I don't think it's for us to judge, but the daughter says that their the parents are Orthodox Jews all, all along, you know, like um, the way I see this is like all the efforts they made um, about kosher food, but like what that effort meant in Iran, it meant that they need to go underground to kill these chickens, to have chicken that it's kosher. What it meant in the US is that they go to, kosher butcher, but it, but still the effort was there. The next generation, clearly, at, at least the daughter, again, we don't see a perspective of the two sons, but like the daughter, though definitely culturally Jewish, she she says that like when she started dating the, the husband, like, oh, and he happened to be Jewish, but like it, this that doesn't mean to be this like, this is such an important part of my life now because she, it's a very complex life and a very, in a certain way, beautiful life. She she gets a career, she has friends, all things that were never an opportunity for the other generations of women before her. Um, but I don't know, the rabbi perspective can be good here. <laughs> so I look, so I'm jaded with the rabbi perspective and you know, you know rabbis, there's go-to things, but I, I'll share with you one insight and Ariella and I were talking earlier and, and I think her perspective and it's not my versus hers, but I think what she is talking about also resonates. So I wanna balance what I'm about to say with an understanding that I, I do agree with what I was saying overall. Um, here's, here's an idea that's brought down in, in various sources. So, and, and really there's, um, there's, uh, there's two types of feedback. There's positive feedback and negative feedback. And both can be motivators. So like if you do something and get a lot of positive feedback, you'll do it again. If you do something, you get a lot of negative feedback, you also might do it again because who are you to tell me I can't do it, right? <laughs> it's like, you tell me I can't do it? <laughs> oh, you're going you're gonna to see who's, who's, who's going to, right? It's like you tell someone, don't look over there. You tell someone don't eat from the tree of knowledge. Boom. I mean, like, right. God figured that one out right away. So a lot of the time, so motivate, we're talking about motivation. There's positive motivation, but also negative motivation. And I'll give you another example, a difficult example to give, especially nowadays, but anti-Semitism, right? Nothing brings together Jews, unfortunately, like anti-Semitism, right? Somebody, God forbid, I'm not even going to, I don't even want to want to say anything specific, but so, something, God forbid, happens. And the next thing you know, the community is banding together and, and across the board, federation with Chabad, with this, with that, everyone's got a kumbaya. So what's my point? My point is like this, that, you know, there were temple times, times of the temple when when there, the Beis Hamidosh was standing and, and it was like this positive feedback, miracles and everything. It's great to be a Jew. And then there was a time, there's a time of persecution for Jews. But that also can embolden the Jewish spirit. It's like, you're telling me I have to convert? I'm going to show you. I'm going to be more Jewish than ever before. But what happens when you tell someone, when you tell a Jew, no positive reinforcement, no negative reinforcement. You just do whatever you want. 
We're not going to reward you. We're not going to kill you. We're not going to, whatever, whatever you really want to do. It's whatever you want to do. Now the question is, do you really want it? Right? That's the question. Do you really want it? Or So this is one way that's explained. The Rebbe talks about this, how you have people, again, related to the story, people who in the old country were very stark, as they say, very, um, you know, um, right. orthodox and strict, strong, you know, very, you know, uh, um, adherent. Even amidst the pressure, they came to America where it's easier. And the next thing you know, things start slipping away. And the question is, how does that make any sense? So interesting. How, how does it make sense? Like, it's like, it was easier. It's sorry, it's easy. It was harder then and you were doing it. Now it's easy. Because sometimes when it's harder, you have to. Let alone the fact that in many times you had to be Jewish because the Gentiles didn't accept you anyway. So what are you going to assimilate? They don't want you. So, so if there was no option to assimilate. What do you mean? Oh, you want to be like them? They don't want you. So you have to stay in your box. You have to stay in your lane. So there's no choice even. But that's another piece of it. But I so all, with that that being said, I, I you know the, the Rebbe would speak about this that the challenge of our generation is the challenge of relative more or less. Do what you want. And now the question is, so what do you want to do? Not because it's not because you're going to get candy and not because someone's telling you no. What do you want to do? You want to do a mitzvah or not? You want to go to shul or not? It's up to you. So that's where it really comes from us. That, that's the rabbinic insight. But at the same time, I totally, I, I totally agree with Ariel's perspective that you're dealing with people and generations that want to let go of the identity, the you know, they're associating the older generation with all sorts of baggage. And I mean, they're trying to cut ties with the past. And part of the past can be the Judaism. Right. So it's the old, it's the old ways. It's like, oh, you and your old like Yiddish. Listen, I, I'm going to confess. I've, to, I've said this before, but I'm, listen, it's confession night. My grandparents used to speak to me in Yiddish when I was a kid. And you know what I said? Listen, I wasn't always uh, a rabbi. What did I say? <laughs> I said, stop speaking to me in Yiddish. So we would speak English. As a kid, I didn't appreciate it. Do I wish now I would have, I would have paid more attention? Less of course. Enough. Yeah, of course. <laughs> me too. But, but you know what? It's like, sometimes when you're young, you're like, oh, it's old fashioned. I mean, a few years later, as I was studying the Rebbe's talks in Yiddish, I'm like, oh man, it would have been more convenient to start off with some background. And don't worry, we spoke. I heard enough to, you know, to get me going. But yeah, anyway, I, so I think both are true. I think that, you know, there's nuance and but it's I think it's a lot. There, there are a lot of angles on it, but enough, enough about me or enough, not about me, but enough, uh, <laughs> enough of me talking. Thank you for that perspective. Well, I think it's interesting. Did anyone else have that idea of like that she needed to let go part of her Jewish practice, because I don't think it's an identity. It's just a practice in order to really evolve to the person she needed to be, or, or you didn't get that, that just, from the book. She came here to shop. <laughs> right. But that was isn't, isn't that every Jewish woman? That's a new religion, you know. That's, that's part yeah. of the religion. Right? Yeah. Just flaunting it. I. I don't know, they were such polar opposites. Like she just came here to have clothes and perfume and you know, kitchen clutches and entertain. And he saw the evil, I think, that happened in Iran, you know, like they were talking about what happened in the the baths, the ban and you know, the prostitution and the assaults. And he saw what was evil in that society when he came here he could see what was evil in this society, you know, women getting educated, you know, I mean, he saw the evil in both places. Even till the end of the book, basically till later in his life, he has a few episodes in which he says, we should be, but it was better then. Yeah. <laughs> Even though the life, the, the physical life was extremely hard there, there was some some aspect of his spiritual life that he thought it was better in Iran, I think, all through the book, you know, till the end. But I, I, I just wonder what that transition needed to be in terms of, of 
choosing and picking what is needed for her identity. And, and she said like that she loves cooking certain dishes and that, so, so, so I don't think there was that, that idea of like, everything is behind me. I don't want anything to do with Iran in, in a negative way. It was definitely some, some fun pieces of it, but then, um, yeah, just that strong, strong um, need to fit and find who she was made her say goodbye to some of her previous characteristics. They were not a match made in heaven, I don't think. <laughs> I don't think. Right. Yeah, they were just such polar opposites, and it, it was it was terrifying. I'm just glad they weren't my neighbors. <laughs> right, <laughs> never, never had to. Yeah, it's unseen or unheard. I mean, I don't know. I this is a memoir, and, and I think she's being completely honest, but the extreme of that relationship, it's hard to imagine. Um, going back to her life and how all these events shaped her, um, were you surprised at all about her first marriage and the dissolution of it as an effect? Were you almost disappointed that she got into marriage that quickly and, and, and almost like naively? Or what was anyone's thought on, on that? first marriage that she had, short, two years, I think it was. To me, it just seemed so fast and just a non-important issue in the book. Mm -hmm. just, a, just a minor, you know, little yeah. deviation. It, it seemed like she was trying to please her mother and father. You know, okay, you fixed me up with this, uh, Jewish Iranian guy, I'll marry him, I'm going to cook, I'm going to clean, I'm going to, you know, try to be what you want me to be. And she just immediately, I, I think, you know, I tried, but this isn't for me. Yeah, she got it right away, the fact that she wasn't happy. I honestly was disappointed at her. I was like, really? You're getting into this marriage? And at the point, um, I didn't know whether the marriage worked or didn't um, when I was just starting to read about it. Like sometimes those, I mean, they said they dated three times. Maybe the parents did a good research. He was an amazing man and they were happily ever after. But just of how the process went through and after all her exposure and seeing her parents, I was like, are you really doing this now? <laughs> like dating two times and marrying up person that you have no connection with. And, um, and then when, when you see how the, the, the situation evolves, it's like, it's good to see that she was able to stand for herself, but yeah. And then, and then how her relationship evolved in its sentiment, like the fact that she was able to find this second husband and, and have a, what it seems a very healthy relationship. I, I definitely, it's that, that weight of the, the past, I think that, that that was that relationship. It's a way to say that like, as much as she was able to go to college and at that point already be her own self away from the, the parents that had raised her in Iran, she was going back to it somehow and she needed that. So that was, I, I don't know, just, I, I, I agree, Steve, it was like a detail in the book in terms of, I don't think it had more than 10 pages that the marriage is, is called marriage, the, the chapter, um, but it gave me that impression a little bit. But yeah, definitely, um, overall interesting. How, how do you guys think that the immigrant Jewish experience will differ from, it's marked by the fact that this is a family coming from Iran. I don't know if you have had any familiarity with this specific. I know a few Iranian Jewish families that 
our first, the kids are first generations or, or yeah. Um, but do you think this is very different from like Russian Jews or any other, in which ways? I'm, I'm just curious. Uh -huh. My my grandfather came here in 1917, so uh, I I was born here, and uh, my mother was born here, but my father was born in Russia. But they were able to assimilate. Um, they were also more they were more European when they got here, where I I think the uh, Sephardic you know people from Iranian um, they went into a culture that they had to adopt, they had to spend probably 70, 80% of their time trying to convince out the outside sources that they were fully Iranian. Where in Russia, there wasn't that. They, they lived in a, uh, in a shtetl and uh, they, they were Jewish when they left the house, they were Jewish when they got back into the house. But they also had the, the environment when they went into a city for something, they, um, these were more European cities and a different culture. And I think that culture blends better in America than the, the strong Sephardic culture. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I thought a lot of, of it was, and, and again, I was always trying to separate it. It's like, is this like something they got because they're Jewish? Or if we would have read a concealed book from a non-Jewish person, how similar their experience. I think it could have been very similar, you know? And it's Steve, what you're saying. It's like, I think a lot of the experience is just because they live in such a different cultural place in, in so many ways. Um, there is a book that I actually recommend. It's a novel, but it's based on the author's experience. It's called A Woman is No Man. It's a, and we've still talked about it. Um, well, I bet about a Muslim immigrant to the U.S. and her experience, like there, the, it's a family experience. It's, it's, it's. I, I went back to contrast them a lot because it's, it's very different, and and the other one is really, really tragic to a point that I thought about bringing it to a book club, even though this doesn't have anything Jewish, just to to make those contrasts. Um, but I just think it's a really hard book to read. Um, so we're not reading it, don't worry. But if anyone wants in their free time <laughs> to read it, well, A Woman is No Man, but it's that, um, you see that patriarchal system, it's also in place. Um, it's masked as like a religious require, but I think a lot of it is just a cultural require. And it's convenient system for men to to perpetuate in in, in many ways, you know. Um, it, and that just was my my idea of the book. I think a lot of it is the difficulties they have integrated is because they come from Iran and they come from generations living living in Iran. Interestingly, how many years? She she the, there's one or two chapters that are very interesting. Um, about the history of Iranian Jews. And they arrived to Iran more than, I think it's been more than 2000 years to the point today. So it's not nothing that we've seen, not many communities have so, so long. I mean, most Sephardic communities that were in Spain were already displayed 500 years ago. So you don't have that 2000 years, I don't know, Russian Jews are, do you know how long they've been in Russia? Is it that long? I don't know. You know, they, they, they went across Europe into, into Asia and Russia. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think once the second temple was destroyed, things kind of moved fairly quickly, right. but definitely Iranian Jews has, have a uh, strong, a strong, so. strong. Use. But I'll also say to your point, just because I, I wanted to jump in at some point, even in Atlanta, I don't know, even, but in Atlanta, in Toko, am I wrong here? There's an Iranian show. Right. I yeah. it. I Straight up. It. My neighbors are Iranian. <laughs> yeah. So, but there's something about, you know, sticking together and their unique cultures and unique traditions. And it's about, you know, very strong identifying. 
I'm, I know there are, you know, there's like an Israeli Chabad center, and I know there are Russian shuls, maybe not in Atlanta, but in other communities. But I think there's a strong, um, strong identification with um, amongst the Iranian uh, immigrants as, as many. And there is something it, about that. Is that a valuing their, it's really hard for me to understand why that happened because they, they're critical of that life they had in Iran. They're very, very critical. Even the, even the mother who, who herself came, she was east, easily <laughs> convinced to talk about all the horrible things. But then at the same time, she wanted only to have like, it need to be a, a, a wedding, a Persian wedding. It's not even like a Jewish, it's a Persian wedding. It's a Persian, um, we were just mentioning about like the Shabbat experience it was a Persian Shabbat experience. It wasn't about like the religious piece of it. So they are very proud somehow. It, that's part of the dissonances we all have. I'm not necessarily judging it, I think. Um, we all have it in our own ways, but they're critical. What, what ties them together is the Iranian part because otherwise any Jewish part, hello, um, any, any Jewish experience could be relevant for them. Yeah, but um, it, was, it was again different from what we've, I think is the first memoir that we read and um, it's, it was definitely interesting um, option and, and I'm happy to hear good feedback that people enjoy it. Um, and yeah, so any closing comments, something you wanna discuss that either intrigue you like, you liked, you didn't like of the book, I would love to hear about it. Well, I mm -hmm. hope your brothers, David and Albert, I hope they had good marriages, Jewish marriages and they continued the Jewish tradition. Right. Yeah, I, I was happy to see that as well. Huh. I, I think my experience, if every book I pick up leads me to other books. At the beginning of the week, I, if, if I didn't have any assigned books from the book clubs I'm reading, I'm reading something else. And after that, I say, what should I read now? And I start looking at, Jewish review of books, New York Times review of books, all that. But all you need is a book and read the book and, and, and it will open your mind to other things. This book, and I was afraid, by the way, that it was a woman's book. I wasn't going to enjoy it. But this book made me think, when I, when I order books, when I go into a bookstore, whether I'm in New York, here, any place, I go to the Ashkenazi section. I read every book about every Tzaddik that's Ashkenazi. Nothing about Sephardic Tzaddikah. Uh, so because of this book, I ordered, uh, well, first, Baba Sally. I mean, I, I know about him, but I've, I've never read anything. And of course, I'm, I'm already halfway finished. It's absolutely fascinating. And that opened me up to this. Um, I'm reviewing along with the Torah portion. This is uh, Abir Yaakov, who was the son of Baba Sali. So all of a sudden, I'm, I'm opening up, and who knows what else this will take me to. Uh, take but it's just every time you read a book, you just don't know where it's going to take you uh, and, and what interest it's going to open. Right. And we learn, I mean, it's that world, world that is outside that we have. Even when she, she started talking about Bukharian Jews um, from Afghanistan, yeah. I was like, I want to learn more about that. Like, what is the yes. Bukharian? Because here too, there is a, a Bukharian community. I know nothing about the Bukharian Jews, like literally nothing. They, they were, there was like ethnic cleansing from those countries. Like there's no mm -hmm. one Jewish yeah. person. I mean, even Iran has a few thousand Jews today. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that you want to be a Jew in Iran, yeah. but, um, some other country, I, I don't know, I agree, like, it's it's an unknown part of our own, like, religion yeah. and traditions. So. And we're so lucky now, because any, any thoughts that we have, anything we're reading, and uh, now, in the last two years, it's changed dramatically. Almost every Yiddish word that I don't understand, I can Google, 
and it's there. Where just two or three years ago, maybe one in 10 Yiddish words had a, uh, you know, you, you could uh, find out what it was. So uh, it makes it much easier to read, you know, a lot of things, uh, you know, particularly in the Baba Sally book, uh, you know, I've had to look up. And right. Google's right there to, uh, you know, be your assistant professor all the way through. But you get the books on paper, right, Steve? Or when I can, absolutely. Okay. Because okay. I, I pass them on. Plus, I feel, well, this one, uh, um, you know, it, it's the daily uh, Torah portions. Yeah. And, uh, and it's very, very technical. Um, you know, it goes into um, the, the more esoteric uh, you know, portions of the Torah. So I, I want this in my library. I'll keep that. And then also, if it's just novels, you know, fiction or historical fiction, for a few to, like, uh, and it, it, Dina, this morning, or was it yesterday, you told me about a book and I ordered it. What's the name of that book? Oh, The, the Last Kings of... Yes, yes. Well, uh, Last Kings of, of what? Uh, Arab. Uh, the title, but it's a, it's a book about, um, there we do, do, two Jewish kingdoms in China. Yes. The best yes. and... I can't so, think. well, it was five dollars more. It was like fourteen dollars for the uh, Kindle, okay. and twenty-one dollars for the hardback. Uh, I actually prefer the softback if they had it. It's easier to hold, hold and read. But anyway, any the print edition is uh, if it's just five dollars, six dollars, ten dollars, I'll get the print because now I, I send them. You know, each book one will be for my brother, one will be for my niece, one will be for my sister. You know, so uh, uh, one book might be read by ten people. Yeah, it's and then that, I love going passing on books there. along. Yeah, even so like I, I, I'm, I'm part of groups that people are like, "Hey, I'm looking to buy this book," and I'm like, "If you promise me, it, they're stupid, like novels sometimes." You know, um, someone was looking to buy. It's called the Vanishing Half. It's a it's a novel, and I'm like, "If you promise me, you'll pass it after you finish. You can get it for free." <laughs> either either give it back to me and I'll find another home for right. it, or you pass it on. Either way but is fine. Right, but right. get it get it going. Absolutely. Get it going. Yeah. As long as yeah. it doesn't stay in your library, I'm okay. Yeah. Steve, I just looked up the title. It's just called The Last Kings. The Last Kings. Yes. Kings. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I should have it in two or three days. Uh, while we're talking about that, uh, Rabbi Ari and Ariel, I'd, I'd like to uh, sometime just. Um, this is chutzpah, but you know, um, I belong to quite a few book clubs and other, you know, I'm active with other things. Um, once, sometimes it takes a week or so, according to the source, if it's, in, if it's a, a bestseller, I can get it on Amazon in three days. If it isn't, it could be seven, eight, nine days, once in a while, 10 days. So if we're getting the book like a week or 10 days after, and then we have to order it. And then as my mother would say, then Ash read it, you know, it, it, it gets tight. So um, since, we, since we know we're going to have another book in 30 days, maybe if you two met the third, you know, before this, do you see where I'm going with this? Give us a little more time. We can uh, have, um, I, I was thinking about it, Ari, we, we could put the season schedule out. And have okay. dates, and, and the dates can be a little bit flexible, you know, if, if it's if something needs to be but like different monthly books, it can be, hey, this season we're going to read seven, eight books, here are the books, you know, and people mm -hmm. can order at everybody's convenience. I, I think that's great feedback. Yeah, we actually, the book we were looking before, it was, it was not in prime. So I'm like, nope, it's not going to work. People are not going to get it in time. Um, but it's a fascinating book that will put it back into the into their schedule. So, yeah, Steve, no, point well taken. And I think the first few we were doing that when we went into a session, we already had the next book lined up. Yeah. The last few we've been a little bit uh, a little bit late on. Um, but I think that brings us to an announcement, which is um, Mazel Tov. Pencil in hand. Mazel Tov. <laughs> well, no, hold on one second. Not, not what you're thinking. Mazel okay. Tov to Ariella. Ariella is expecting a baby oh, oh, over the yeah. summer. Mazel so Tov. In the, in, the next, in the next little bit, right? Yeah, it's for June. So. June. Oh, wow. That's, 
So number number one, super grateful that you've been doing this over the last few Absolutely. months, even with everything going on, and you know, <laughs> of the whole family. Um, so number one, so that's so we wish you know good wishes and and all sorts of blessings and anticipation, only good things. Um, and with that being said, we'll be taking a few months break until the baby, and a few months after the baby, we're give what's um. What, why am I blanking on the term? We're going to give you what's maternity leave? Maternity leave. Right. <laughs> maternity <laughs> leave. Exactly. That's like so, my work is giving me 12 weeks ex maternity leave. Exactly. <laughs> um, and and I, I was speaking with Ariella, and our thought is that um, in the fall, we'll pick it up around, um, you know, what, we'll, we'll be back in touch as far as what we're going to do it. And, and hopefully, the goal would be to do this in person, to be able to do. It. Now, maybe you want to join online, maybe you could, but you know, to do yeah. it on, in person, we could have wine, we could have some best, some refreshments, and whatever. We could have a nice discussion. It's um, it's you know, it's nice, it's nice both ways. There are conveniences to to doing it on Zoom, but I think there's something special about doing it in person. And with that being, and, and with all of that, Steve, I think you're you're um, and Ariella, you followed up with this as well. I think what would make sense is. That as soon as we know, kind of, you know, I mean, we're going to let things play out over the next little bit. As soon as we have a better idea of dates, we will, I think what makes sense is to preset the dates and ideally the titles as well. And that way everyone can order the books and we have dates and, you know, and that's, uh, that's, and that's it. And then we'll be, we'll be formalized. Um, but we don't want to be too formal. You know, we like to also be a little, um, it's like, you know, Chabad is always like a little bit. So it's like the Chabad rabbi says to somebody, you know, hey, come to Shul, whatever. The fellow says, Rabbi, I don't like organized religion. The Chabad rabbi says, have you ever been to Chabad? There's nothing organized about it. Anyway, I'm kidding. It's not disorganized, but it's, <laughs> we also like spontaneity. But we'll, we'll... There is a, a value to know. And, and people, I mean, honestly, people may choose to skip a session and that's totally fair. That's fine. Right. You know, like, you can do your research, have the books in advance. So I think like when we launch the 2.0 book club, if people, if there is interest where both of us are really looking forward to it, um, we're going to give the list of the books per month. And maybe we can keep this as an annual event. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Very good. All right. So stay tuned. I think that's the okay. point. Stay tuned for information about when we're going to pick it back up again. And we'll have the book thing, but we'll make sure to get the word out well in advance of the first session and in, in time where, you know, the whole, the whole scope is going to be mapped out. Yep. So that's, that's the Absolutely. goal. Yeah. And maybe we can send, um, if anyone skipped a book or wants to see all the books we read, we can send a summary list um, area of all the books with. That would be a good idea. Yeah. Well, should I send it out to the group? Yeah. I yeah. think, I mean, yeah. most people are just, um, Cool. In case someone wants to look back, the progress right. I think six seven. Mm -hmm. books. Okay, yeah. So let's let's talk about so just like kind of a basic summary of of the books, the, the titles and the books that we cover. I, I think even just if they're the titles. Um, I'm happy if I can write a few lines up of each. Just okay. like what it were. Like. Yeah, if I'll I'll send it out for sure. Okay, great. Happy. Sounds good. Ariel, I don't want to give you I'm more work. You. Um, no, that's that's fine. That's my fun. <laughs> okay. Yes, Rabbi, sorry if we count on you to uh, let us know about the good news. Um, I'll, I'm on it. You know it. I'm on it. We'll uh, please God, Bisha Atova, in the right thank time. Thank you so much. We'll, uh, it'll, 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 we'll, we'll give the announcements. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you Very so excited. much, everybody. <laughs> All right. Bye, well, I'll see you soon. See you all around. We'll see you guys soon. Send life is slowly going back to oh. normal. Thank God. Yes. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Rabbi, yeah. Rabbi Ari. Thank I just want to tell you thank something. You. I don't have to take Tanya, Tanya's study anymore with you. Tanya, in a nutshell. Oh, I, done. <laughs> I just, Tanya, in a nutshell. I look at her and said, "I don't have to take any more Tanya classes." <laughs> Easy, done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I love it. Bye. All right, Zaygesund, everybody. See you, Malka, see you well, Steve, and Steve, and Ariella. Thank you so much, as always, mm -hmm. and lots of blessings. All right, thank we'll see you, you guys soon. Bye, thank you, everybody. Oh, bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.